Coming up this week on Art Rocks, a beloved Louisiana architect who started a national trend by recapturing the styles of years gone by. I said, well, I'm, I'm building a house. I'd like, he said, you mean you'd put this junk in a house? I said, I sure would. Searching for the hidden meaning in music? And they just don't build them like they used to. That's all next on Art Rocks. Support for this program is provided by Georgia Pacific Port Hudson Operations. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. With additional support from the Renaissance Baton Rouge Hotel, centrally located for business and pleasure travel, the Renaissance offers intrigue style and southern hospitality. And by the Watermark Baton Rouge, Art, history, and commerce come together in the heart of downtown Baton Rouge at the Watermark, located in the historic Louisiana Trust and Savings Bank building. And by Prescient's Point Capital Management, a fact-based private investment manager using forensic investigation to benefit clients. Research with impact. And by Ann Conley Fine Art, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. Three universities joined forces to create a travelling exhibit honouring one of Louisiana's and America's most influential architects, the late A. Hayes Town. Why the major collaboration? Town got his undergraduate degree in engineering from what is now the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. He earned his master's degree in architecture from Tulane and LSU students got involved in the project by creating 3D models of Hayes homes from ply and basswoods. ULL Dean H. Gordon Brooks remains a big fan of Hayes Town's work and his legacy. I've known A. Hayes Town for a long time. I first met him in the 1960s when I was a student at LSU. Hayes was not ashamed of our culture in Louisiana, and we have a lot of influences. We have our French culture, we have our Spanish influence, and we have the Acadian style influence. And Hayes was the first person to really kind of recognize that it was okay to borrow from these uh, past styles and the past influences. The central element of A. Hayes Town's houses is the use of old materials a proportioning system which is very comfortable, sometimes grand, but he was also willing to go with a modest if that's what you needed or that's what you could afford sometimes. And then also the incorporation of baseboard treatment, shoe molding, all manner of details, chair rails, uh, wood windows, things that are comfortable. And he would love to use, like in this room that we're in today, he used natural wood. This is cypress and it's unfinished cypress. It's just simple. Although he was willing to paint it too because most of the precedence that he was using was using painted wood. But as you can see here, he's perfectly willing and capable of detailing it so that it could be natural as well. He created a whole industry, a whole industry in used materials, used architectural materials. Uh, that didn't exist before that. It was modernism and we were using new materials. When I started building my house, uh, Bill LeBlanc was a contractor and he was down at the river tearing down a state building. And I went and I said, Bill, could I buy those bricks? He said, what do you mean buy them? I said, well, I'm building a house. I'd like, he said, you mean you'd put this junk in a house? I said, I sure would. He said, I'll give you all these bricks. You make me a little sketch in the front of my office building and I'll make you all the bricks are yours. So I got the bricks for nothing. I went downtown and they were shoveling the slate roof off of a, a drugstore down on 3rd Street. Went to the contractor and said, I'd like to buy them. He said, just pay those men for taking them off. So I got slate free and I got the bricks free. That's why I was able to get, get this house paid for. Hayes was perfectly aware of the hot and humid climate that we have in Louisiana. And so he was also aware of how other uh, previous builders, indigenous builders, had dealt with it. Broad overhangs, 
porches, central halls to get, keep the breeze going through, uh, large windows, large openings. And so what he did was he kept these fundamental uh, environmental design uh, features of southern building, but then he updated it by connecting the outside to the inside. He was very capable and very willing to use a contemporary lifestyle to design his buildings. So they had a more of an open plan and less traditional planning. One of the very special things about his homes is the way he relates spaces. Oftentimes you enter a space and you look through the space to the outdoors, maybe in an interior courtyard or something like that. And that relationship between indoors and outdoors is very, very much an aspect of his work. And oftentimes you would proceed into this interior courtyard and then there's another kind of gateway to another external space. So it's a sort of procession of spaces that you experience in his homes. The warm material create a very strong feeling of tradition and values. It's got to be a trend and it's publicized through first Southern Living, Southern Accents, um, all of those magazines. And then HGTV picks that kind of thing up too. I don't think they would be able to quote Hay Hayes Town. They don't know who that is. But you know, that's the case with a lot of architects who are visionaries. They make a statement, people learn the statement, learn about it, and then they continue to promulgate it throughout pop culture. We're sitting in what was originally the Art Center for Southwest Louisiana that was designed by Hayes Town in 1967 and it opened in 1968 with the first exhibition and town really designed it with the spirit of antebellum architecture this was actually modeled after the hermitage plantation so it's very very much in the style of Hayes town this is as close as we're going to get to a whole building a whole room that the public can come into and when he finished his engineering degree here at USL SLI, I think it was at the time, then he went to Tulane to study architecture because they had an architecture school there. And he spent a lot of time, he told me he spent most of his time at the French Quarter, just drawing. And that's where he kind of developed his eye for proportions and for detail and for materials. It was one of the highlights of my life in New Orleans. The French Quarter was wonderful. People don't know how wonderful it really is. It's one of the great pieces of architecture in our country. During the Depression, um, the government created a program called HABS now, Historic Building Survey, Historic Architectural Building Survey. And Hayes was hired out of Washington, D.C. to document houses, um, antique houses, historic houses. And so he learned from the proportioning systems that these gr mostly grand buildings presented and mostly large. I measured all the old houses in Natchez, and all through Mississippi. And at one time when I was a kid at school, I worked for Richard Coke in New Orleans. He was the head of the uh, Louisiana delegation, like I was Mississippi. And we used to visit each other back and forth and see what we were doing. So all of it helped me to get information. I always get up at two o'clock in the morning, no matter what time I go to bed. He was a fascinating man, smart, uh, talented, <laughs> and he knew everything about his buildings. You could ask anything about one fireplace or another roof line or something, and he knew everything about it, every detail. A 35-minute video introducing town's family members, homeowners, and architects forms part of the traveling exhibit. This week, we have an excerpt for you. Here's your very own sneak preview. Growing up, every time you didn't want to do something, he would get very frustrated and say, well, you have to do what you don't want to or you never get ahead. Just keep working. He was the youngest architect to be hired by a big firm in Jackson, Mississippi. And when times got hard, he knew he'd be the first to go. He said everybody else took off Saturday and Sunday and he went to work on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, kind of before you knew it, Mr. Overstreet made him a partner. Then it became Overstreet in town. And he worked there and built things uh, then his father died in Lafayette, and his grandfather was dying, and he decided he needed to be closer to home. So we moved to Baton Rouge in 1939. 
he, uh, in the 1930s, of course, you had the Great Depression, the stock market crash. He was uh, uh, in charge of measuring historic buildings in Mississippi, where architects were hired to backwards engineer historic buildings so that uh, the premise being that if there was ever a war in the United States on our soil and our buildings were destroyed, we could rebuild them. So our, we wouldn't lose our culture. <laughs> My father always worked at home. You, I'm sure other people have told you his weird schedule that he lived. You know, he would go to bed at night and then he would get up around midnight and work in the middle of the night. Funniest thing about that is he would make that pitch black Lafayette coffee, drip it, and then he'd go wake my mother up and she'd sit up and get a demi tasse of that pitch black coffee, lie back down and go to sleep, and he would work. Um, he had so much energy and he required very, very little sleep. There's never a shortage of cultural treasures to enjoy in Louisiana. The trick is knowing where to look. So here's a list of some of the exhibits, performances, fairs and festivals on the calendar in the weeks to come. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. Headed up river to Cincinnati, Ohio now, where composer and performer Eddie Kwan works to reveal how the world of musical expression continues to evolve. Let's see how Quan is helping his community adapt by thinking outside the box, tune by tune. What does the 21st century artist look like? It's a great question. I think the old model of conservatory training, which is try to get really good at your instrument and hope you get a job in an orchestra, that is already dead and gone. It was difficult. It is even more difficult now. Some might say impossible. So if you're looking from a purely career-oriented perspective, that model of musicianship, of professional musicianship, doesn't make sense. So you need to branch out. You need to make yourself more accessible. You need to make yourself more able to connect with diverse communities, communities with different needs, artistic, social needs. And you have to be able to work with people, and you have to be able to work together. Hi, my name is Eddie Kwan. I'm the director of My Cincinnati. My Cincinnati is a free daily youth orchestra program for children in Price Hill. Price Hill has historically been a working class community. It's an interesting time to be in Price Hill as part of the My Cincinnati community because Price Hill is going through some pretty significant changes. And we have a unique vantage point as artists in the neighborhood and as musicians in the neighborhood and as teaching artists that are working with children to be a unifying force uh, for the community and to be an opportunity for folks in the neighborhood to come together to connect over their shared humanity and to work together towards a common goal, which hopefully and should align with the goals of the residents. So a majority of our students at My Cincinnati are young people of color, many of whom come from immigrant families. So while all experiences are varied and different and nuanced in very, very important ways, I found that my background as a child of immigrants and as a person of color allowed me uh, unique opportunities and, and paths to connect with my students in important ways. I am beyond grateful for my time here. 
it's difficult to imagine what I would be like and what my life would be like without my Cincinnati. So my Cincinnati has around 100 students, a little over 100 students enrolled. The vast majority of those students are coming uh, to orchestra every single day. So if you were to walk into our program building at peak hour, you would see you know, at least two orchestras rehearsing downstairs, all of the practice rooms filled with private lessons happening or mini sectionals. Upstairs, you would see uh, another orchestra performing in one room. You would see a sectional happening in the hallway. You'd see another sectional happening in the conference room. You'd see some mini lessons happening in the back corner room. You see the winds happening uh, in another room. So really, when you come in, there's just this unstoppable and fluid movement of music happening at all times. I like that it's somewhere safe that I can come to after school, like without being judged by anybody else. And also, it's free. I like at school, I have to pay for lessons. And, but here, it's mostly free. It taught me how to be a leader how to lead and how to picture yourself as a teacher and as a student to see both sides of the spectrum. Like a lot of the younger kids, I think some of them are getting the idea that music is a very powerful tool and some of them it takes time. I think some of them are getting that, that idea that music is powerful enough to spark a change. Please. The adult orchestra is one of my favorite new additions to My Cincinnati. The adult orchestra is led by Laura Jekyll, who was the founder of My Cincinnati, and it came, uh, it came about pretty organically. The only qualification is uh, you live in the neighborhood. Otherwise, just like My Cincinnati, it is a completely free program and we provide all of the instruments. So right now, uh, Laura's orchestra has around 35 adults, some of whom are My Cincinnati parents, which is very cool, but mostly just uh, neighborhood residents. The kids are, at this point, definitely better than the, the adults. Laura will sometimes ask some of the older my Cincinnati students that have parents in the orchestra to help out, to demonstrate, to model good position, uh, to play along. So that's a really cool opportunity so the kids have a chance to be the teachers. I think one of the most profoundly beautiful things about music and the kind of music that we're playing here is that music has its own set of rules and expectations. And when you're playing a piece of music, you are in fact stepping into a world that has its own laws, that has its own culture, that has its own traditions. And this set of laws is completely removed from our own, which means that you have to expand your imagination enough, you have to be creative enough to commit to being in this alternate reality, which is what it is. And when you do that enough, all right, one more time, you are then given the kinds of tools that are required to make that subtle shift in your thinking. First note should be like a bomb, boom, ready? What can be different about my life? What more can I imagine for myself and for my family and for my community, for my school? So in order to do something expressive, you need to use a particular kind of technique. What music does is that it presents you with that opportunity to ask that question, and then it gives you concrete steps to get there. Back home for another Louisiana treasure. You don't have to visit many small Louisiana towns before you find that the state has more than its fair share of grand old courthouses. 
but it's hard to find one more spectacular than the Ascension Parish Courthouse in Donaldsonville. Still in service, the courthouse has been adapted to accommodate modern amenities. Chief Sheriff's Deputy Bobby Weber keeps up with the history of the venerable structure. This courthouse in Donaldsonville, which is the parish seat of Ascension, had a courthouse on this site ever since the founding of the city of Donaldsonville, which was in 1803. So the site that we're sitting on today has always been the site of the Ascension Parish Courthouse, at least in this block that we're sitting in. The current courthouse was built in 1889. It was built by an architect named James Ferret, working with a, a committee of uh, some of our police jury members back in the day. Ferret was a, a very a well-known, famous architect at the time who uh, built a lot of structures in the New Orleans area. Pay attention to the clock. We are very proud of our clock in our old courthouse that's still working. It was, I think, built by a, a German clockmaker. However, it was in disrepair for quite a few years, but the uh, citizens of Donaldsville came together and was able to find a clock mechanic, uh, so to speak, who was able to repair that clock and get it working again. And we're very, very proud of that. There certainly has been a new roof placed on this courthouse. And when the courthouse was built, it was probably half this size, so when we go out and take a look at the courthouse, you'll see where the sheriff's office wing was added on, probably in the, uh, the 70s, and the other side of the courthouse, you'll see where the clerk of court wing has been added on. So it's expanded the capabilities of housing governmental agencies here. And when you still come to the courthouse in Donaldsville, you can have all the departments that it takes to run a successful business or a successful town. You have the voter registrations here. You have the assessor's office here. You have a parish government uh, office here. It's a still in operation as a full service courthouse where you can uh, conduct a lot of business here in a courthouse that was still that was built in 1889. Now right behind this courthouse, the previous building that was used as a courthouse and a jail that was built in 1867. It's still there. Certainly it's not used anymore, however it was used up until 1975, so it's a, uh, probably one of the oldest buildings left standing in Donaldsonville. You'll be hard pressed to find a building in Donaldsonville, there may be one, I think it's the old St. Vincent Institute that predated the Civil War. Some people know Donaldsonville was bombarded during the Civil War and it lost a lot of its buildings, so just about every building in Donaldsonville is going to be post a Civil War era, uh, including this building here. Unfortunately, we suffered several fires in our courthouse. The courthouse that this replaced was only one year old. It was built in 1887 or 1888, and within a year it burnt, and they built this courthouse. And it's a Romanesque style. It was built probably within a, a year of the other one uh, burning down. As you drove into Donaldsonville, you've seen some of the homes, even in the city proper, that it seemed like it just had more character and certainly well built. What a lot of people don't realize before our interstate system, before airline highway and before rail, uh, we are situated here in Donaldsville uh, on the Mississippi River at its confines with Bayou Lafouche, uh, which is located right behind the courthouse. And that was the interstate, that was the intersection of two major bodies of water, one running to the Gulf of Mexico south of us and one running kind of east towards the Gulf of Mexico, which was Bayou Lafouche. I've seen pictures of last century. It was big enough by you to have paddle wheels behind it. So a lot happened. Donaldsville was always kind of the jewel of Ascension Parish. From the 1830s, uh, it was uh, the capital of the state of Louisiana for, for one year. Unfortunately, it didn't stay here. It went back to New Orleans. So besides having the, the plantation country with a lot of sugar and rice influence, it certainly had a lot of mercantile influence with the intersection of Bayou Lafouche and the Mississippi River being right here located in Donaldsonville. Donaldsonville even uh, in the day uh, boasted a opera house, uh, large uh, hotels, uh, the Grand, uh, the Bell House, uh, the Lemons Brother uh, Farm Supply Store that's been here, probably one of the oldest uh, merchandise stores uh, that was established right here. So it had a lot, a lot of uh, business and mercantile business in Donaldsonville and all uh, paid taxes uh, towards having a courthouse. The gentleman who founded Donaldsonville was William Donaldson and this, he, he founded this city in 1806. At that time you had two parishes, St. James and uh, Ascension were combined and it was called the Acadian Coast. And for him to, he knew if he was going to have a successful town a successful city, he had to kind of step up to the plate. So he offered the judges and the justice of the pieces at times and the sheriffs that I'll donate two lots of ground f uh, to the city of Donaldsonville. And I think it was lot 48 and lot 49, which we're sitting on today. 
And he said, I'll build you a courthouse and I'll build you a jail at my expense. It's hard to turn that down uh, in 1806. So that's really how Donaldsville helped itself get established by the founder saying, I'll donate a courthouse to you and I'll donate a jail to you. Not only did he donate the first one, when that one burnt down in 1810, he built another one at his own expense. Years ago, as court was becoming busier uh, with our court dockets uh, increasing, they took the big courtroom upstairs, which was one courtroom, and they divided it into two courtrooms. And it became a very modern style courtroom, and they were very small with uh, small ante rooms. Although it survived at the time and it worked for a while, there was a real push uh, in the last uh, several years to let's get this courthouse back to what it needs to be, a beautiful one courtroom courthouse. And we have tried to uh, recreate that original courtroom upstairs and a lot of work has been put into that. The courthouse is just one beautiful building that you can look at. If you would take a trip around Donaldsville and see some of the uh, homes that were built here uh, by some, some of the, the business owners and some of the people that worked and lived in Donaldsville in the day, uh, it just shows a lot of character to those homes and how people took pride in their community. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that all through Donaldsonville. And that'll do it for this edition of Art Rocks. But as you know, every episode of the show is available online at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want more, Country Roads Magazine makes another great resource for finding out what's going on in the arts all across the state. Until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.